I'm Lisa Allen with HTTV. And I'm George Lukacs. And today we are here with Kevin Corbett, the Executive Director of New Jersey Transit. We are thrilled to be sitting down with you today, Kevin. Thank you for joining us. No, my pleasure. And um, we're going to jump into the meat of this because we have a lot to talk about. And we want to talk here about New Jersey Transit structure, the challenges that you've been facing, and pretty much the future of transit. But before we do, because a lot of viewers may not know a little bit about your background, can you briefly tell us what your experience is and why you would choose to take on such a challenging role? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, my background is I uh, grew up in the transportation industry uh, even uh, when I was a, a young boy, as so I was exposed to it, and uh, certainly uh, it was in the private sector, more on the maritime uh, side. Uh, I've uh, lived in China for six years, oversaw operations in Sub-Saharan Africa, worked for a Norwegian company, spent a lot of time in Europe, Middle East, and uh, then uh, later got involved in, uh, on the government side and uh, doing uh, logistics, uh, particularly uh, you know, internationally, and then had uh, oversight of the Port Authority uh, and um, was involved in economic development projects uh, in New York. and. Uh, so the nexus of transportation and uh, economic development was something that's always been a passion. Uh, and uh, as far as New Jersey Transit, uh, you know, it gets a lot of a bad rep uh, for a, a number of reasons. But um, a, as a system, the bones are extremely uh, good. It goes back, you know, well over 100 years. It's a legacy of the 19th century railroad, uh, particularly on the rail side. Uh, so it's an incredible challenge to uh, turn around. Uh, it's sort of, uh, if you look out the, the window here, it really is a gullet of America for transportation. Uh, you know, this is a sort of the Super Bowl for transportation. So, uh, you know, certainly it's a, it was an honor to be uh, uh, chosen uh, for, for the position. Yeah, it's a big challenge. Um, you know, a lot of people don't know how it's structured. And so New Jersey Transit is, your position is actually you're hired through the board. Um, the governor makes a recommendation, but the board ultimately has the choice. You're funded, I think, I believe, through the legislature. And then you also interface with Amtrak. You were talking about New Jer uh, Port Authority, New Jersey Port Authority, New York Port Authority. Can you explain a little bit about the structure that it makes such a challenge in order to, you know, address some of the issues happening? Sure. I, th I think one, one minor correction I'd make is that yeah, we are funded partially through the legislature, but the other part, which is extremely important, is it's also about half our... Uh, Revenue comes through from our passengers, from fares, uh, and then we get a certain amount also from advertising or some real estate. Uh, yeah. But um, the, um, as far as the uh, structure, really it grew out of the private sector, it dominated transportation, uh, uh, you know, uh, and certainly rail and uh, bus transportation uh, through World War II and after World War II, and advent of cars and highways, you know, air travel, you had a dramatic change of. Uh, you know, uh, the private railroads, most of them went bankrupt. You know, the Pennsylvania Station was torn down in New York. And so, uh, you know, in the 1960s and 70s and, you know, we saw the 80s, it was really a, 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 a collapse of the uh, transit system. Uh, and since then, you know, government largely took over. So you had Amtrak took over the Pennsylvania Railroad, you know, uh, a passenger business. Uh, the freight railroads, uh, you know, uh, now you have, you know, Conrail, CSX, and Norfolk Southern, which are, you know, is, a, is a huge part of actually New, New Jersey's economy, but that's not under you know, public transit. So mm -hmm. it was a consolidation of the uh, large, largest part of our bus fleet was from uh, PSE&G, public service, as it was the legacy of, of the bus. And it was uh, just, we're just coming up to our 40th anniversary that it was created to uh, be from New Jersey to have a, a, a consolidated uh, tra transit system that, you know, bus, let or rail light rail and uh, now access link access, right? Mm -hmm. Kevin, can, can you just go through and tell us how large your budget is and maybe just some very general breakdowns on how that's actually allocated within that budget? Yes, yeah, right. I think there's both the operating budget and the capital budget. Uh, I'd say the operating budget is uh, about 2.4 billion. Um, uh, most of that uh, goes to uh, you know labor costs. We have 11,500 odd people about 10,000 of those are unionized either, uh, you know, on the bus side or on the rail side. Um, and then on the uh, capital uh, side, we have a capital budget that's a little bit deceptive. It's uh, about 1.5 billion, um, but uh, I'd say about 700 plus million of that comes from federal uh, um, FTA or FRA. 
for uh, particular projects uh, that are already underway, you know, resiliency projects, say Sandy projects. Um, uh, then another almost 600 million of that is debt service from previous projects, so it really isn't capital that's available to uh, go into projects, uh, you know, for our, our real uh, um, building projects that we need to do uh, for maintaining a state of good repair or even expansion. So we only have about 100 to 150 million that's really available mm -hmm. for, uh, you know, uh, new projects. When you talk about projects, can you give us an example of one that you're working on right now that, that you see as being really critical over the next couple of years? Yeah, I think, uh, you yeah, there, there are a lot, uh, you know, I'd say there are a whole number of, of, of projects going to state of good repair, and to me that's one of the most important things we have to do to make sure we get reliability back into the system. But the one that I think that it gets most publicity is certainly uh, the Portal Bridge project, you know, over... Uh, you know, going into as part of the Gateway program, but New Jersey Transit is that's the 109-year-old uh, swing bridge that's constantly opening and delaying everybody who wants to get into New York. Yeah. Um, that project is being run uh, by New Jersey Transit. Uh, we have it uh, do 100% design. It's been approved for uh, for uh, EIS uh, from the federal government. So we're just waiting. To, uh, the governor recently put up 600 million cash as a local share. It's about a 1.6 billion, 1.55, 1.6 billion dollar project. We've worked very closely with uh, the FTA and the FRA, Federal Transit uh, Administration and Federal Rail uh, Administration, and uh, we are really we are ready to uh, move on that project. You know, tomorrow once we know from the federal government, you know, uh, what we're going to get from the federal government share, and we're partnered with Amtrak, uh, who uh, work, we've worked very hard to get uh, improved relationship with Amtrak, and uh, we've, we've done that recently. You may have seen the governor's announcement, so we're all ready to, to move on that project, which is probably really a project of national significance. So you generally feel that the, the budget that you have, uh, and it's such a difficult position that you have, uh, there's so much being discussed about New Jersey Transit and how critical it is. Is there a certain number that you feel that you need more in your budget than you have right now? Uh, I would, I, you know, I think if you look at any transit agency around the country, if you talk to any of my, uh, my uh, colleagues, you know, my peers, uh, they all could use more funding. And I think if you look at a 20-year cycle, you'll see anyone in any, any agency, MTA or, you know, SEPTA, they go through ups and downs where they get investments and there's long periods uh, where we're not, you know, um, unlike the private sector, you know, uh, to, to your point, our budget, we are dependent for, you know, roughly half our budget from state appropriation. And, you know, uh, once you're there, you're fighting with health care, education, and everything else. Right. So uh, often you don't get the funding you need. Uh, right. Certainly, uh, New Jersey Transit for as an almost a decade now has been you know, really underfunded for a lot of critical needs. Um, uh, so uh, you know, we'd always like more, but certainly what Gover uh, Governor Murphy and the legislature gave us last year was a good, uh, good start. And you know, we're uh, you know, uh, certainly hoping for more this year as well. Is the expectation that you're going to be profitable or do you want to break even? What is the goal of public transportation in general? Well, it's, 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 it's interesting, it's sort of a, you know, from an academic, uh, you know, I spent some time at, uh, at Princeton, the Woodrow Wilson School, and so you have the, the sort of the theoretical model, and then you, know, you have to live in the, in the real world. So uh, certainly, the, um, I lived overseas and traveled extensively, even in my last job uh, as a senior executive of one of the, the world's largest engineering firms, uh, that uh, Hong Kong, for example, uh, there, they are genuinely profitable. The, uh, going back to what the Harrimans did, you know, hundreds of years ago uh, here, they have land uh, land holdings that they get that land holding that generates revenue for their transit system. Mm. So they can really generally be profitable. But in the uh, United States, uh, mostly, you know, all, all the transit systems uh, do not make money. They lose money. So uh, it's the nature of your, your fares are regulated, so you cannot charge fares high enough to be profitable. And arguably, if we did, you know, if 50% of our fares roughly, 50% of our income is roughly from uh, our fares, well, if you doubled our fares, you know, uh, your ridership <laughs> <laughs> presumably would drop. So, you know, and that's why the public, private sector didn't make money on it originally. So uh, it's seen as a public, uh, you know, almost like a, uh, you know, a, a public uh, entity or certainly a publicly uh, supported entity. So profitability is, uh, is not what we look at, more we look at performance metrics. Uh, you know, how do we measure for our customers? And then uh, that justifies going to the legislature, you know, what do we need and, uh, you know, how do we, in my view, uh, I think this last year, try to prove to the governor and legislature that the money they gave us was a uh, wise investment. And uh, uh, from my private sector background, I always look at things as a return on investment. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Some of them may be qualitative, you know, for, for the riders, but it's also quantitative. You're going to make these kind of investments. What are we getting back? And are we using those uh, assets and investments, uh, you know, wisely? And so that we get confidence from the public and from uh, the legislature and the governor that they want to ride our system. So, you know, the 50% that mm -hmm. comes from our riders, we want to see that ridership go up. Right. Uh, and, you know, eventually when you do have to have periodic fare increases that they feel, you know, no one likes to pay more, but they'll say, yeah, no, we're getting good service. So, you know, a reasonable uh, increase, you know, they, they may grasp, but they'll take. Uh, and then also the legislature and the governor will feel, you know, it's, it's well run. We want to make sure, it's, you know, we keep it, you know, healthy so that you get the appropriate funding. Kevin, you've had a, a lot of unique experiences that you're bringing to the job. One of them that I think is, is interesting is your international experience. Is there a model out there from a city or a country that you feel is something that we should aspire to? I, I think everyone is different. You have to look at labor history and practices. You know, uh, uh, you know I lived in China for six years and I've been going back and forth, uh, you know, since. And, um, you know, in the 1980s when I first went there, you know, after college, uh, they, the train system there, they still had, you know, you know, German, Japanese built trains and people were shoveling coal. I mean, it was, you know, they were old coal uh, engines from like the 19, you know, 1930s, 40s. So you look at the transformation China's done, you know, uh, it's, it's incredible, uh, a lot to be, you know, impressed with. I would also say, you know, environmental standards, a lot of other issues that uh, labor, you know, uh, standards, uh, safety standards that, are that we would not accept. So, it was, you know, it's not, people will often say that as a, you know, uh, it's a different situation. Right. Um, you know, Europe has different requirements. Germany and France have some very interesting uh, parallels. Uh, England certainly. Uh, uh, so there's no one model, but there's certainly a lot of lessons uh, that we can learn from uh, others. I, oh. I think England's very interesting with what they've been doing. Yeah. yeah. What are some of those lessons? A couple well, of them. Well, one th one thing is, and you touched uh, a little bit on George on the funding side, is that the. In the U.S. and certainly in New Jersey, you've seen a real, uh, you know, uh, irregularity. It's not a predictable funding. I think most transit uh, executives like to have a dependable, reliable uh, funding stream. That's a real uh, challenge. Um, I think uh, I look at um, England, uh, you know, the Crossrail project, some of the major projects they've done there through both labor and conservative governments. There's been constant, steady, you know, combined efforts to make sure they fund those projects, and they've really been transformative for London. So, you know, having a, a reliable, you know, a predictable funding stream is, is really uh, critical so you can do that long-range planning and capital investment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so. It's interesting. Yeah. You know, if we get uh, a little bit more nitty-gritty, yeah. uh, so the consumer who will be watching this, um, talk about s some of the problems that you have right now and why these problems exist. For example, maybe cancellations that occur or uh, there's a car that's too short. Uh, and, or people every once in a while, uh, are, you know, stand in the aisles. I take the uh, summit to Hoboken, and uh, I like that. It's good. It's a good ride. Uh, but every okay. once in a while, you'll have, and we were talking about this earlier, a car short. And that's because I guess you're going through a whole refurbishing, correct? Yeah, there's, uh, oh, there's. Yeah, how long do we have? Uh, yeah, I, I, we can break for dinner and come back. <laughs> right. or yeah, we have six hours. You know, all the all the headaches. But uh, the problem is a, a lot like uh, if you have an old house and you don't maintain it, and the roof goes, and the electric hasn't been upgraded. When you start getting problems, they they, they you know can yes. accelerate and, deter and, and deteriorating. Uh, so reversing that is a, is a real problem. Uh, when I came here, I, I was aware from friends in the industry and. You know, people who had worked here, you know, that things were uh, in bad shape, but you know, getting in, it's sort of like, he, and maybe I didn't have the best inspector in buying my house, and I go in and I find out the place was a lot worse than what the inspectors <laughs> report. And uh, so, uh, particularly on, on the rail side, um, the, uh, the fleet of, equ of equipment is, uh, some of those go back before the 40 years when, the, when New Jersey Transit was started, started. I think, you know, the arrows, some of the single-decker cars that have doors in the middle, um, you know, are older than most of the people riding on them. Uh, so it, one of the big measures that we have is mean distance between failures. If you've been on mm. a train where we have the multi-level, you know, the double-decker, as some people call them, uh, those we uh, need to uh, call mean distance between failure is about 400,000 mile plus. Mm -hmm. uh, even though we have uh, very good maintenance uh, people in our uh, maintenance facility, um, that uh, the arrows, it's about 45,000 miles, so almost a, you know, a tenth of, uh, you know, just because it's trying to maintain, like in Cuba, the old, uh, the, the old cars, you see American cars, yeah. uh, you know, it's sort of analogous for the fleet. A lot of the engines are, you know, also, you know, in that 30 to 40 plus year fleet. So 
uh, you know, that puts a challenge for uh, maintenance. I think there's a lot more we can do to improve our, how we maintain things uh, and, uh, you know, automate that, uh, computerize a lot of the things, uh, make those kind of, but that requires investment. Uh, but the other thing is to bring down the average age of the fleet. Right, and, right. And no, not like the airlines. That's what yeah. they do. They it, circulate. They have old airlines, and all of a sudden, there's one of the brands that comes out with brand new planes, and the other ones look old. Yeah, so. but one of the uh, problems, uh, you know, that we people really went through a rough summer, which also affected equipment. Particularly, this last year was a very tough year. And when I came in at the end of February, uh, positive train control. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about that. Uh, was a federal uh, mandate. Uh, New Jersey Transit started, uh, awarded the contract in 2011. And when I came in, it was only 12 percent done. A mm. uh, whole batch of reasons for that, but you know, uh, changed the way uh, the approach of how we we're going to get that done. Worked with the FRA and others to uh, make sure we did that. But it, it took you know ex extremely uh, painful and tough decisions to take a lot of equipment out and uh, have it installed, take wayside uh, in a very complex system. Uh, so uh, that really hit the riders very hard on, on equipment availability. Yeah. Does that, do, having said that, is, is there an issue, as so many industries have, in finding technicians actually to, to, to work and, and, and on these repairs and uh, changes that you're trying to make? Yeah, uh, yes, uh, but I also uh, have to say a lot of it's good management, making culture. I think uh, there was a period of about eight years where there was no, uh, only one uh, pay increase of uh, uh, I think it was about 1.5 percent over eight years at the same time that the market was coming back. Mm -hmm. So we uh, have a very complicated, you know, for where we have catenary uh, wires like on the M&E. Uh, the, uh, elect the electrification, electric traction uh, system is extremely complicated and very dangerous. Uh, if you're not, you know, that's where safety is paramount. Um, but we're competing with private utilities, so you know if they're able to offer somebody you know a, a five thousand dollar bonus and a ten percent increase, uh, as much as you know, there may be benefits and a camaraderie about being in transit and a pride that goes with that. You know, uh, you have to be at least at least you have to be able to keep it, uh, you know, be in the ballpark. And then we're now getting some flexibility to be able to do that to hire, uh, be competitive. But it's in a strong economy, it certainly is, is a factor. Yeah. yeah. How do you prioritize? I mean, I know safety, communication, hiring. There's so many yeah. big issues that Repairs. you have to tackle. How do you prioritize? Uh, oh, I think uh, you know, it's sort of basic basic management. I think uh, you know, I came from a large a large corporation, so. Uh, you know, you break down, you can't do everything yourself, so you have to build a good team around you. Uh, I think there is the capital, uh, you know, there is um, the capital projects aspect, and that's a whole uh, aspect of, you know, part of the maintaining of the state of good repair. The rest is, you know, the maintenance. Uh, what kind of uh, team do you have to maintain? How do you make sure they're performant, measure the performance? Uh, and then uh, breaking that down into the different groups. I think technology is woefully behind here, so we have to make some significant, uh, a lot of things here are still done manually uh, by a paper. So if you look at best industry practices that you see, private sector or public sector, whether it be Singapore and the public sector or, you know, private sector, with the private sector railways, you know, what can we le learn and sort of leapfrog the various <laughs> stages that we miss by uh, investing that technology now? Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's so much here that uh, that that's so involved in the whole transportation that we have here in New Jersey. Do you have um, outside consultants that work with you? Because it seems like the burden of the complexities is just overwhelming. Yeah, well, it, it, it's overwhelming. I mean, it's a pretty, as I say, it's a pretty exciting system. You know, if you like, you know, if you like playing, uh, you know, uh, chess, you know, 3D chess makes it more, more, uh, you know, more fun. Um, I think it's really getting the right team though, and delegating and uh, holding them accountable. Uh, you know, I'm not a, a, a computer expert, as my uh, uh, children are very quick to tell me. But you know, uh, one of the things is getting you know who are the best. Uh, you know, having uh, you know relationships. Sometimes it's formal consultants. Sometimes you know what's going on in that industry, and, and hiring somebody who really can uh, make a difference and knows how to work collaboratively uh, with the other partners. So we've added some uh, really key leaders recently uh, to build this strong management team. Well, and I've seen you guys out from a PR perspective, you're out doing listening sessions. I've seen some videos where you're out at the train station and you're listening to riders. And I think that's really important. And can you talk about what are you taking away from those listening sessions and how do you implement them so that people know that it's happening? Because it could be a really nuanced rollout also and people don't know what you're, how much you're doing. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, thank you, a good point. And I think there's a lot of room for improvement, uh, you know, communication, uh, uh, you, know, you know, it's not my uh, background, uh, you know, as you probably can tell, but, uh, but I, I do believe is, uh, you know, in 
being direct and being straight with people. You know, you can cut through a lot of nonsense. And I think most people, after they vent, you know, uh, you know, I can understand they're frustrated. You know, they just want to get back to work or home, pay their fare. They don't care. They want to hear about anything else. Right. Also, there's been accumulated frustration because it's been going on so many years, whether it was Amtrak, Summer from Hell, and I was affected from that a few years ago coming in from Morristown. It was like, it was, you know, and so you put on another year, PTC, it's, you know, it always sounds like something else and there's accumulated frustration. But I think once people get that out of their system, you know, they appreciate that, you know, George, to your point, that it really, you know, when it runs right, it's actually, you know, a pretty good system and, uh, and there's some, you know, loyalty to it. Our ridership, even after this last year, on the rail side is up 2%. Uh, and, uh, you know, technology, uh, we have uh, with Summit particularly, you look at the experiment with uh, Uber and Lyft. Uh, my son works in Chatham and, you know, a lot of times they'll, you know, uh, going into the city or whatever, they'll, they'll, they'll use Uber to go to the station. But, you know, I guess the cost of going in, into New York, you wouldn't take an Uber all the way in New York, costs a hundred and something bucks. So they take, and uh, our ridership, I think, yeah. is up in a large part to working with uh, the Ubers and Lyft. So I take a lift to the train station. Yeah, yeah. you do. Yeah. yeah. Oftentimes, or when I come home late, I'll take a Lyft or, or Uber. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I'll, take, I'll say this, because I feel like a lot of, um, again, just going back to the public relations piece of it, mm -hmm. you guys are really trying to get out there on social media, let people know what the updates are. Um, some of the feedback that I've gotten, just people knew, um, my husband rides the train also, and he was on last night, and he's like, I knew what the schedule of the train was, but then, and they were making announcements, but he couldn't hear it on the train. So, you know, is there, wh where is that in the process in terms of trying to make it better? Uh, was your uh, husband with one of, one of the regular communities I have happens to be uh, who... Uh, we're on the m and &E. <laughs> Yeah, and m and &E is, uh, is the governor. And yesterday, he, without telling anyone, he was on the train, he went into the city and got on at Newark without, you know, not, none of us knew that, that he did that, you know, I guess himself in the detail. But, and he will be the first one to text me, you know, uh, he, you know, the speaker's out, I didn't hear a clear announcement or something, so yeah, I, 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 there's no escaping it. Um, I think, you know, part of that's getting more customer-oriented, uh, particularly in the age of technology. If people are waiting on a platform or they're getting up in the morning and they see, okay, train 6610, if they get a push notice, which is something we just started, and it was really the governor himself who <laughs> <drove> <laughs> that. encouraged that. Uh, yeah, yeah and, but it's true is that even, uh, you know, if, if a pilot has a problem in the cockpit, their, their job is not even to communicate with a control tower, a tower, it's to fly the plane. And so for an engineer and the dispatcher and the mechanics, uh, you know, 10 minutes can go by in a flash while they're trying to deal with an issue. But if you're the commuter waiting on the platform, 10 minutes can seem like a lifetime. Mm -hmm. So what yeah. we did is create a war room for after last summer when we started having, you know, where there was a real, you know, a lot of frustration. And we said, okay, we need to get a communications uh, war room, sort of like we do when there's a major uh, snowstorm or hurricane. And so we're now operating that way, you know, uh, from uh, 6 in the morning to 7 at night where we have everybody together. So there's somebody from rail ops who's right there next to somebody in comms and said, okay, and, and somebody who's also on social media there who's saying, hey, we're getting, we're seeing you know, people are tweeting X, Y, Z. Sometimes it's wrong information too. And people start believing stuff. So it's, you know, no, you know, somebody tweeted this, that's not, you know, there is not a six passenger, that's, a, you know, there's no fire or something. That's not true. Uh, but then that's when people respond so they calm down, you know, they get a sense, even if it's not good news, that they feel at least they know yes. what's going on. Yeah, the communication is really critical. Getting to the micro issues again, overwhelmingly, uh, over the years that I've uh, uh, been on the New Jersey Transit, the conductors have been really polite and really wonderful. Is there a training session that you take them through periodically? There, there is, and I think we're we're trying to uh, you know upgrade that. I know a lot of the engineers. I knew them actually for years long before I got this job, and they, they even laugh. Who knew you're going to be my boss someday? <laughs> um, but most of them are great. Like anything, you know, eleven thousand employees, you get occasional you know a uh, person a bad day or just you know shouldn't be in the customer service business. But most of them are really you know really great employees. Uh, you know, same thing with the engineers. You know, whether people were mad at the engineers for not showing up. You know, there were, it was more that we were below a critical mass of engineers. It wasn't necessarily that engineers were being, you know, calling uh, in sick. I, I think they're entitled to vacation. You know, there, there may be occasional. There are a few that do that, and then you, you know, there's a way to follow up on that to make sure that the the few bad apples don't ruin the reputation. But by and large, we're just below critical mass. But the employees themselves, uh, I think, particularly those customer facing the conductors, um, they do not have. It's very frustrating for them if you talk to them because. Uh, on like Amtrak, you ride Amtrak, you have, you get your ticket gets scanned with a scanner. Yeah. Right. Uh, and, um, you know, but not only is it good for collecting data and the, the fares, et cetera, but also the, the conductors there, they can get information that they're allowed to have. 
The FRA does not allow some, uh, conductors to use cell phones. You know, uh, they're restricted. But if they have an approved device, they can, we can send that message so they can get the same uh, information that the riders get. Right now, you know, I can get on, I can look at my iPhone, and the conductors will know. They'll come over to me and say, "Kevin, what, you know, what's going what's on?" Going on. Wow. You know, and wow. so that's very frustrating for them, and it frustrates obviously the commuters. How do you not know? Yeah. So how how is it? Why, why? What's the reason that they're not allowed to have it's a safety issue safety from issue. the okay. Federal Railway? You know, said you know conductors, engineers, you know crew should not you know they should be doing their not job, not you know chatting on the phone or texting or anything, yeah. or sort of texting and driving. Maybe we should tell all the drivers who text yeah. when they're driving. You know, that's what that's why taking the train. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's true. Whatever you know, rough times we have a uh, usually tra transit on the rail side. You know. People, you go try driving. I did that when I was. I tried going driving, you know, a couple of days trying to go through the Lincoln Tunnel rush hours. I, poof, I was right back on the train. Yeah. The only time I'll drive into New York is at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. That's it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we are almost wrapping up, but I want to get to a really critical issue, and then you can weigh in if sure. you want. Sure. But you have some graduating students because you were saying you were below critical mass on your engineers. Where are you at with that, and how will it quickly impact in a good way yeah. um, our trains? Uh, well, I wish it would be. As quick. I wish it could be a lot quicker. Uh, people uh, often don't appreciate that on the engineers. Uh, the reason, uh, the issue we really have now, PTC's installed. There's still a lot of testing to do, so we're 100% only running on PTC, but we currently run on PTC, but we have a backup. But, so the real issue is, uh, is engineers, and uh, you know, there it takes 20 months to, be, you know, to become an engineer. It's a bit like becoming an airline pilot. The, the rules, uh, what they call the NORAC rule book, is about this thick. They have to know each line, each you know, anomaly uh, on the whole route. So it's, it's a really extensive, you have to know a lot of mechanical uh, information, et cetera. So it's, it's a uh, tougher uh, process than you'd think. And when I came in, we need about 400 engineers uh, altogether. Uh, and we were down below 330. And with 20 uh, retiring uh, a year on average, you know, the, we were well below. If we're at like 370, we should be all right. And then you have a little bit of a cushion, you know, anything above 370, 400. Mm -hmm. so, uh, and we had uh, stopped uh, doing training uh, classes. In fact, we annulled, we trained and then f uh, laid off people that we had trained uh, a number of years ago. So uh, they went to Virginia and Florida, which was, you know, so we trained them and they went elsewhere. Um, so we, we started training when I got in, started. We now have six uh, training classes going on. Uh, the f uh, first class we have is graduating uh, this May. And there should be about uh, uh, 10 or 12. And then uh, that'll help at least stem the, those who are retiring. Uh, and then the rest of the classes start kicking in in uh, late September, October, and we'll have about 30 in uh, September, October, and then another dozen around December, and then after that a regular, you know. Uh, so, uh, so we'll see an I incremental, um, yes. not as many delays, or, and we'll see an improvement. Yes. Okay. I would say it's going to be tough this summer because we also have Amtrak doing uh, work in Penn Station. Not as bad as two years ago, but still significant work on the Long Island Railroad side, but that'll impact all, all three railroads there. So it's, uh, you know, still getting through between uh, that work and engineers, uh, but I'd say by October, you're going to really see, you know, by the fall, you know, the, the heavy uh, infrastructure work will be done at Penn Station. We'll have uh, at least be at where we need to be with engineers and everything from then, uh, you know, will be significantly uh, smoother as far as, you know, reliability and, you know, cancellations, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Great. I'm sure that's music to <laughs> the commuter's ears. Well, yeah, right? it's about the commuter. And I think, yeah. I think you've done a wonderful job yeah. of explaining to the commuter who's watching this the complexities that, that New Jersey Transit has to deal with, not only on a daily basis, but almost on an hourly basis. It's a 24 hours, as we were talking earlier, 24-7 uh, job. Yeah, yeah. But, really but is. When you get it right, it's, it's, you know, it's an amazing system. It's one, it is the most complex uh, you know, rail system in, in the country. So uh, when you get it right, it, it is, it's, pr it's pretty neat. And for the commuters, uh, you know, it's still going to be a rough patch. But as you get through, you can start really looking at you know, what kind of amenities we can offer. Communicating is obviously a big part of that. Uh, but uh, you know, getting, get, after we get through this year, I think they'll you know, definitely see uh, you know, significant and steady, uh, steady improvements going forward. Great. Excellent. Well, That's thank wonderful. you so much for your time today. Really Thank appreciate you, that. Okay.